Yes. Hello. This is a topic that is very dear to me, and I think it's very important. I like to preach about data structures. Often I, I see in, in development that people focus way too early on uh, the algorithms and do not focus on their data, which is makes me a bit sad. And this is not only for performance characteristic, uh, characteristics. So if you have something that looks like a key value store, please use a, a, a map and not an array or something um, or a list. Um, but it also goes deeper than that because how you define your data structures can improve the quality of your code and make intentions clear. And that's what I will talk about today. The idea of this talk is basically based on a very, very good article by Alexis King. Um, she uh, demonstrated uh, all the code examples in Haskell. And it's really not hard Haskell code. You don't need to know Haskell to understand a block post. It's just Haskell has a very short and concise syntax. So it's very nice for blog posts because you don't have to have massive uh, boilerplate code. Um, nevertheless, for this presentation, I want to show this in Java because I think at least most of the people know Java, even if they don't like it, uh, like me. But um, that's one common denominator, I guess. So. The main problem what you have is the possibility of failure. So you, you get data from somewhere, be it from the disk, be it from the network, some HTTP request somewhere from the outside of your application domain. And what you get is maybe a string, maybe you get some raw bytes. It's not in a state that you can use it. Often, like the API or whatever you're using, for example, Node.js, will already parse it a bit so you get a JSON object or you will get a UTF-8 string so where it's already decoded and you can be sure that's a valid UTF-8 string. But obviously those general frameworks can't know what your domain logic is or what your requirements are. So the idea is to express your domain logic in the data structures itself. So if we take this very simple example, we want to get the first element of a list. So if I just write this function, it, it takes a list at input and it just returns the first element. Thing is, this will not actually compile in Java because Java has checked exceptions and this get function may throw an exception. In fact, you would need to declare this like that. Personally, I absolutely don't like exceptions. I think exceptions should be used if the failure is not recoverable. Um, so to basically crash your program and fail. Other uses, I'm not a fan of. So let's get rid of this uh, index out of bounds exception and do something like this. So this is not, again, this should still, is not perfectly valid because I should surround it with a trial catch, but this actually can't go wrong because I'm checking the size first. So, but I'm just omit for simplicity sake, I'm omitting the trial catch block for this example now. Other languages like JavaScript or TypeScript wouldn't require you to have a, a try-catch block here because they don't have checked exceptions. It's just Java. So that's why I'm avoiding it here. So here we basically do some a very simple thing. So either we, do we check first if the list is actually big enough to get the first element. If not, we return null. So the problem is now, if you use something like this, so for example, we take the list of arguments and convert it to, to a list, and then we get the first element of that list and print it. The problem here is our, our program lies to us. It says here, well, I will get a string back, but I'm not actually getting a string back. If you look here, I, I might be getting nothing at all. So this is a really big problem in languages that don't have strict null checking or have null at all, like Java. So your, your program may lie to you. So that first thing is you should always avoid null and not only avoid it, in my opinion, should outright ban the keyword null from your code base. And not only in assignments, so here return null, but also in, in if clauses. So you shouldn't check if something equals null because then it means you already made a mistake earlier. This was what I want to show for the rest of this talk. So we want to get to the situation where this won't lie to us. So in Java, we can't actually guarantee this because everything can be null. But at least we can force our code to look that way by, for example, having a test in CI that checks if there is a, a null assignment somewhere, at least. So what would 
we did the alternative. Um, we could use Java's optional type, and this type is basically available in all languages. You can write it very easily yourself. It's either it is that thing or it is nothing. So this way we can check, well, if the size is bigger than zero, well, then we have something. Otherwise, this is empty. This has looks very similar to the uh, original code with null, but the important difference is that now our types don't lie. So we don't get a string here. We might get a string here, and this is the important difference. This makes, from, from a code readability, I don't need to look into this function to, to know if this can return null. No, I know it will return null, or the equivalent, nothing, because this is now optional string. Uh, the type tells me that this might fail. So then I, I need to uh, capture the failure state and print it. So this is already better. We now have the failure state explicit, but it's still not perfect. The problem is that we are pushing our failures downstream. So if had fails, we push it to the callee. So here we push it downstream. So under that headline, here we need to uh, handle the failure. The problem is at that point, we might not have the context needed to properly handle this. So for example, if this came from a request, we actually we want to reply with bad request like HTTP 400. Um, if this came from a user input, we might want to present a nice thing. Yeah, you mistyped something. Please do go again or something. Like down here, we might not have that context. So we want to push our failure upstream. Want at, at already at this at this first stage. So before the call to head. Here we want to already see it because here we know, oh, this came from this list of arguments. So then we can say the print out, hey, use the CLI somewhat different. Um, so this is the ideal thing. You want to push your failures upstream um, to get use of all that context you have available there. So how we can do this? We define a new type for this. Uh, this is a basic class and we call it non-empty. And the basic idea is we make this failure case unrepresentable. So here the failure case is that we have an empty list. This is not possible because now we have one element always here. So this is the first element and this is the last. So this might be empty, but we still have the first element. You might, of course, implement some interfaces to make it nicer to work with, but it's just not relevant for us. The important thing is we need an abstraction boundary. So this non-empty thing this can't be con created without having at least one element because how it's defined. But later we'll show you examples where this is not the case. So it's good design to make this constructor private. So only static methods on this non-empty uh, class can create this. Again, I will come back to the uh, advantages later. So this static method is basically what you would expect. We return, again, we can't be sure that the list you pass in is actually non-empty. So this has to be optional. But after that, once we have a non-empty list, we can always just return the first element. Like That's not a failure case anymore because we did the validation already earlier. And not only validated we did, we, we explicitly created a new data structure that captures the essence of this assumption, like the assumption that the list is not empty. And this way, if we go back to our function, now there is no failure case. So this is not an optional T. It will always return a T, but it will require non-empty list. So now, so this is to compare it with the original, like the failure case is gone because we pushed it upwards. Like we now expect the correct data structure already as input and not give a failure case as output. So here we pushed our validation upstream. Yeah. So Always create data structures that met your requirements. Those are different from project to project. Like this empty list example is very trivial, but it's easy to understand. But if you have more complex examples, like you need some specific JSON structure, express this as a data structure and use a private constructor and static creation method or some or the equivalents in other languages so that you can't create an object of this class without going through a validation. So this is the important part. I, I am not able to create a non-empty without having to check that this is already there. This is also why this constructor is not empty because in Java, I could again pass simply null here and then all the benefits would be moot. So this is why I explicitly have this private constructor. I can't call this constructor except from these static methods. The abstraction boundary is that you have to go through the validation to create a non-empty. And of course, the validation may fail. So this is returns optional. 
but if it doesn't fail, you have you have done the validation. It, it's explicit in the type. You cannot cannot go wrong at that point. Now you might say, well, but if you use this, we still have to validate. Yeah, well, of course, that's what we we, we don't get rid of our validation. But it might look similar. But the important thing is, like this string doesn't lie anymore. Like now, this really is a string. It won't be null. It can't be null. So we can do this validation somewhere else. And as long as we pass around this non-empty, we know it always will be a string. We don't have to show, oh, does this come from somewhere where we already validated this? Or is the list empty? Better do a check here. No, you don't need to. You know, this is non-empty. It will always be valid. To create the data structure, you need to have validation. So this is the security assurances you get from this. And this is best used if you do something like a hexagonal architecture or how it's called in it's like it's different approaches, same thing basically. So you have here your outside world and you get data from there. But before you pass it to your business logic, that that's the actual work, you first you do have pass it through those ports. And those ports do basically the validation stuff. So here in the port, so outside of your business logic, you can validate that the data is actually correct. And if not, directly return an error. The business logic does not have to care about errors. Business logic cannot go wrong because you pass data structures that have already been validated. And it's explicit in the data structure that they have been validated because they have been parsed. So that's a, the explicitness. That's, a, that's the big point. In the business logic, you then only deal with the simple parts. You get a string out of it. You, you never have to deal with this. You might ask, wait, I could also just check, well, if the list is bigger than zero in the port and then in the business logic, I just get the first element. Um, this has several issues. The first thing is, you know, don't, like in the business logic, you again, you can't be sure that this has happened. Like if there is a, a typo here, this is somewhere in the port. You might have multiple sources of data. You can't be sure. So basically with this non-empty type, you centralize the code that validates your data about this one particular instance. So the business logic can say, okay, I need this to be validated. And then for to actually call the business logic, you have to validate and pass the right time. You can't forget anything. And again, this is just a simple Boolean. And that's where I come into with this. It's called Boolean blindness. A Boolean only tells you true or false. There's no information attached to that true or false. Like after this if clause, you don't know if this was true because the list was bigger than that, or if you did more validation, it's just true. So in contrast, if you have optional of, of a refined data structure, it is obvious that it is create like this might have been an optional of a data structure implies that this is how the data was validated. Like there's more information there than just true or false. It's either there is validated data or there's nothing. And that's, the core of what I'm trying to uh, get off. Um, so there are a few other advantages of this, uh, or, well, misadvantages if you do this like this. As I said, you cannot be sure that the validation has happened. And this is a nagging fear. Like so many Java code, I, so much Java code I see has if checks, uh, as a null checks everywhere, because you can never be sure that something isn't null. And this shouldn't be the case. You should not to have null checks in your business logic because the business logic should not have to deal with this. Business logic should get the data it needs, do the calculation and return the data, nothing else. You can enforce a strictly controlled set of operations to that business logic. This basically taps into the territory in the area of a, a domain-specific language. You basically, you create a set of data structures that can do just some stuff. And the business logic is only allowed to use those data structures. So it's like they can't go wrong in this case. One particular example, again, going to Java is mutation. Mutation is the root of all evil and it makes the code a lot more, a lot harder to reason about. So this non-empty type does not have to implement the methods that can do mutation. Um, so it's immutable by default. And this way, the business logic can't mutate those lists. You don't get into that problem. That's one of the big things. You get compiler errors if the requirements change. So if you have some new validation that you need to, on top of that 
our example that the list has that is not allowed to be empty. If you need some more validation, for example, that is all below zero or whatever, then you can have one place where you implement those changes and you get compiler errors if the call site has changed wherever this is used. And again, the business logic can then use this new assumption that is now ingrained in the data structure to do whatever it needs to do. And yeah, this is exactly the last point. It, it makes the assumptions explicit. So if you use something that takes a non-empty, it's clear, hey, this at least at least, at least one element. You can have other data structures or other classes that represent other ideas. So you make explicitly, hey, this this business logic needs some data, more than one, some configuration that is well-formed, and some other things, and then it does something with it. So the assumptions are explicit, and you don't need to guess or don't need to know the code base to get those assumptions. This is also very good for onboarding new people, because they can look at the code and don't need to search through all the layers. They, they can go to the business logic at the moment, and they don't need to understand the ports. They don't need to change, uh, understand the validation. They only need to get into the business logic first, which is usually the interesting part. So what if my requirements can't be expressed as a data structure? So this example was very simple with a non-empty list. We could just express it, hey, it has one element and a list of other elements. But often, like the type system of many most languages can't express more complicated um, invariants. So here again, we use the abstraction boundary we can define arbitrary uh, things. We just define or document that this is the invariant. So for example, Java does not have signed, uh, uh, unsigned integers. So we can say, hey, this is a positive integer or a natural number in this case. Again, we have this private internal data and a private constructor because we want this would, valid, uh, inv would allow us to uh, make this assumption like every instance of this positive integer class is actually a positive integer. With this constructor, we would be allowed to val uh, invalidate this. So the only access, again, is from a method that returns optional. So here we can pass out any, val uh, any value, and then it does the validation and returns either a new instance or this. And this is the only way we can create those. We can deconstruct this very easily, so we can get back we can lose information. So this integer might be positive or negative. The class might only be positive. So we can lose information by getting the value out, but we cannot regain it without checking it first. And this is the value. You want always to gain information and make this information gain explicit. This is the gist. So this is basically, this is um, called the new type pattern. In Haskell, this is very easy because there's a keyword for this. You don't need all this nonsense. You basically just write a class and don't export the constructor. Um, but in Java, this works equally well. So thank you. Go read the article if you haven't. Um, it's very good. And now I will check for the questions. Awesome. So Oscar at least has his hand up. So we can start with Oscar. Basically, I agree with everything that you're saying. And it's really nice to see an example in Java because that's something that a lot of us have to work with, even if we prefer not to. Could you just really spell it out for me? What do you mean by parsing? And what do you mean by validating? And why should I do one and not the other? Yeah. So basically validating is checking if, it's the, if the data is correct and then returning either yes or no. So a Boolean. So is list empty? So this if is basically validating. So parsing is more, you have to validate to parse, but it's also then creating the data in a new format that explicitly encodes that you did the validation. So to, to get from the raw data to the parsed data, you need to do validation, but it's explicit in the parsed data. And then if you par pass the parsed data and not the raw data, even if it's validated, like the, the information about this is validated is now encoded in the type. So that's what it is. So. Right, thank you, yeah. Both that article and your presentation makes a lot more sense now. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for 